Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in. My name is Alice Johnson and in this talk I'm going to look at a typical Presbyterian family of Victorian Belfast, the Workman family. The Workman family was one of the main families that I studied in the course of my research on middle class life in Victorian Belfast. My book, Middle Class Life in Victorian Belfast, was published earlier this year. The Workman papers are a rich archive located at the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland and I was able to learn a lot about middle class life from this family's records. As I talk through the family history now, various aspects of Presbyterianism will be brought to light. The Victorian Workmans were Orthodox Presbyterians with a strong evangelical bent to their faith. It was a large family and with almost all the men being called either Robert or John, it took me quite a while to get to grips with the family tree and its various branches. I'm going to concentrate on various individuals from the family to see what we can learn about their Presbyterianism. Let's start with the family background. John and Robert Workman were born in Saltcoats, a small port in Ayrshire on the west coast of Scotland. Their father, Robert Workman, ran a small scale but successful cotton weaving industry. Around the year 1808, the two brothers, John and Robert, went to live in Belfast. In the textile industry, relations between Scotland and Belfast were close, and when they made their decision to migrate, the brothers would have been aware of the expansion of the Belfast cotton industry. The workmen's brought a certain amount of capital with them, and they settled in Little Patrick Street, close to the docks, from where they set up a muslin manufacturing business. I have highlighted the people I will be talking about in this presentation. John Workman Sr. married to Helen, his son Robert of Ciara, Robert's son Thomas Workman, and his cousin, the Reverend Robert of Newton Breda, and his wife Sarah. In 1829 to 30, John got a lease from Lord Donegal and he built two houses in Donegal Square East. He and his wife Helen lived in one. His brother Robert moved from Little Patrick Street to York Street, where his neighbours there included linen manufacturer Andrew Mulholland, the merchant Edward Coey, and engineer William Dargan, all to become prominent names in Belfast. This house in York Street, which was practically in the country at the time, was where Robert of Newtonbreda was born. John was closely associated with the building of May Street Presbyterian Church in 1829, and also in bringing Dr Henry Cook to Belfast to be its minister. This was a time of massive demographic growth and also church growth. When John arrived in Belfast, the population was about 20,000. At the time of his death, in 1846, it had more than trebled to over 70,000. John lent a substantial sum of £3,700 towards the building of May Street Church. But, canny Scotsman as he was, he got the money back at 6% interest. Politically, the Workman family were always Liberal, the two main parties then being the Liberal and the Conservative parties. But John Workman Sr. was the most radically inclined in the family. Until his death in 1846, John supported the O'Connellite movements for Catholic emancipation and the repeal of the Act of Union. When Daniel O'Connell visited Belfast in 1841, there were a handful of Protestants present at the welcome dinner and one of these was John Workman. There is also some evidence that he supported the universal franchise in the 1830s. John was a prominent anti-corn law and pro-free trade campaigner. In his published letters on the topic of free trade, John railed against the landed classes and condemned them for protectionist laws, which he believed made the working classes suffer. In 1838, he wrote to the Belfast newspaper, The Northern Whig, with some of his political thoughts. And you can see it here. Northern Whig, the 27th of March, 1838, remarks upon corn laws, machine labour and combinations by John Workman Sr. He writes, Our lords, that is, peers of the realm, would have us believe that they are not accountable to man, and will they not be accountable to their God, 
they despise and depart from the heavenly lesson by making partial laws and transgress his commands by extortion, taking the money from the poor and only giving half value in return, that they may enrich themselves in place of feeding the poor and clothing the naked. God does not require the industrious poor to prop up the lords above their level in society. We can see here that John had a strong sense of social justice and sympathy for the poor and the working classes. Indeed, he wasn't afraid to promote the interests of the workers ahead of even his own sons. In 1838, when reporting to an inquiry that, that was investigating the distress of handloom weavers, John condemned his sons for depressing weavers' wages, and he publicly disassociated himself from them calling them oppressors of the working classes. John's rather radical political beliefs of the time seemed to be totally at odd with his supporting of the orthodox, politically conservative Henry Cook. Perhaps he was also somewhat out of sync with his own family. His family seemed to believe that John's religious beliefs were unorthodox. His nephew, Robert of Newton Breda described his uncle as a radical in opinion who read Tom Paine and was somewhat sceptical in religion. A letter from John's daughter-in-law to her son recalled that John's death was dark and not that of a happy Christian, which is an interesting and intriguing comment and I wish we knew a bit more about John. Just to say a bit more about Presbyterianism in this period. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the Presbyterian Church split many times. I'm sure those of you who are watching, who are members of the Historical Society, are aware of this. So in 1830, the Presbyterian Synod in Ulster underwent a major split. Some Presbyterians refused to subscribe to the Westminster Confession, a reformed Calvinist statement of faith. Because of this, they were forced out of the Synod. Non-subscribers to the Westminster Confession were forced to separate from the Synod of, Synod of Ulster, in other words, the General Assembly, and form their own Synod in 1830. So we have Orthodox or subscribing Presbyterians led by Henry Cook versus the non-subscribing Presbyterians led by Henry Montgomery. The two sides were distrustful of each other and rigidly enforced their views on their members. The workmans were members of the orthodox or subscribing side, but they saw themselves as liberals and in the various controversies of the day within their church, they took the liberal side. This slide is taken from a street directory in 1868, a Belfast street directory. It gives us an indication of the predominance of Presbyterianism, indeed orthodox Presbyterianism in Belfast. 26 Presbyterian or Orthodox Presbyterian churches, three Unitarian or non-subscribing Presbyterian churches, 15 Anglican churches, 11 Methodists, five Roman Catholic chapels and one Baptist chapel. Any contemporary account of Belfast will often mention the three most influential Presbyterian ministers, the Reverends Henry Cook, James Morgan and John Edgar. They were the triumvirate of preachers that dominated Victorian Belfast. All were high profile, orthodox, evangelical Presbyterians. And there's a little rhyme from the period which sums up their various characters. Then Cook was very Protestant. Morgan by mission stood. Edgar supported temperance and everything that's good. Cook's Protestantism relates to his connections to conservative politics. Morgan was known as the father of missions. He was one of the key founders of Presbyterian missions. And Edgar was the founder of the Irish temperance movement. All of them, but especially Morgan, were at the forefront of church building in Ulster from the 1830s. The workmen's were also influential in church building. In fact, three generations of workmen's were the main impetus behind the building of five Presbyterian churches in the Belfast area, May Street, Elmwood, Fitzroy, Belmont 
and Helen's Bay Presbyterians. The Workmans would have known these three ministers well, and they were friendly with John Edgar. They travelled together with him to see the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. Throughout the three generations that I looked at, the family supported temperance, that is the avoidance of strong spirits, but they weren't teetotals, as there are accounts of them drinking wine. John's brother, Robert of York Street, who attended an independent church in Donegal Street, showed signs of Sabbatarianism. He believed that trains should not run on Sundays. His campaign for the closing of spirit shops on Sundays was rooted in his temperance convictions. Last year, I had the opportunity to go into May Street Presbyterian Church and inspect an old cupboard full of dusty books and Bibles. One of these was the Self-Interpreting Bible, published by John Brown of Haddington in 1778, a popular Bible in Victorian times that had commentary. <clears throat> and this one had the addition of Henry Cook's own commentary and interpretations. I also found several family Bibles. These large Bibles, printed in a large font, capable of being read by the entire family, from very young children to elderly grandparents, had a lively and a dramatic character. <clears throat> there were numerous engravings of locations from the Holy Land, as photographed by Victorian travellers. There were also numerous full page engravings depicting dramatic biblical scenes. Images of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, the prophet Elijah being caught up into heaven in a whirlwind, David holding a decapitated Goliath's head, and a group of beautifully dressed bridesmaids bearing lamps. These were just a few of the many scenes depicted. The family Bible also included the Apocrypha, and I've included here a picture of Judith about to decapitate Hollow Furnace. These family Bibles would have certainly livened up family prayer times, and they would have been used by families like the Workman family. And I think this Bible maybe challenges some of the perceptions we may have about Victorian religion. But back to the brothers, John and Robert. Both brothers lent large amounts of their time, as well as their money, to the developing civic and religious life of Belfast. Civic responsibility was a key characteristic of the leading manufacturers and merchants who actively involved themselves in the civic life of the growing town. The brothers served on various committees, some of them were purely philanthropic, while others, such as the Harbour Commissioners, furthered and served their business interests. If we look at subscriptions in the 1820s and 30s recorded in their business accounts, we can see that between 1826 to 8, the Workman Brothers financially supported 17 different charities or causes. Ten years later, this had risen to 31 different causes, and 38 by 1841. In 1843, their account book recalled or recorded a total spend of £102, 14 shillings and sixpence on charitable causes, and this did not include spontaneous or ad hoc gifts. To put this figure in context, the brothers were each paying themselves salaries of between 100 and 200 pounds at this time. So they gave very generously to charitable causes. Robert of Ciara was the son of John Workman. Like many mercantile sons, Robert entered an apprenticeship in his father's business at the age of 15, at which time he left formal education. After his marriage to Jane Service, a distant cousin and the daughter of a Glasgow cotton manufacturer, the couple lived first in King Street near Smithfield, then from the 1840s at Packenham Place, a three-storey terrace on the Dublin Road. And then in 1854, the family, with now over a dozen children, moved to the newly built villa Ciara on Windsor Avenue. Ciara was named after a cotton growing state in Brazil. Robert had found new markets for muslin in North and South America, and Ciara in Brazil was one of his favourite ports of call. In 
Religion played a large role in Robert of Ciara's life. In 1818, at the age of 14, Robert had become a Sunday school teacher in the Brown Street Sunday Schools. He remained a Sunday school teacher for the rest of his life. He was superintendent of May Street Church Sunday School, and then he set up his own Sunday school class in his home in Pakenham Place. He used his influence to build the Victoria Place School off Great Victoria Street to cater for the working class children of nearby Sandy Row. Robert had clearly inherited from his father a firm belief in freedom of conscience, and he lobbied the General Assembly about this in 1850. Throughout the century, we find that the family consistently supported the voluntary principle, believing strongly in religious freedom and particularly in disestablishment, the separation of church and state, in order to preserve the independence of churches. Despite being an elder there, Robert left May Street Presbyterian Church after a falling out with Henry Cook over the voluntary controversy. Robert believed ministers should not receive the state support of the Regium Donum or grant given to Presbyterian ministers. In 1849, Robert joined Dr John Edgar's congregation in Alfred Street Presbyterian Church, where he also became an elder. When he moved to Windsor, Robert was instrumental in setting up Elmwood Presbyterian Church in 1858. Like his father, Robert and also his son were actively involved in Belfast Town Mission and the Anti-Slavery Society. In 1852, the Workmans opened a new gaslit warehouse in Bedford Street. By this time, the two sons of John Sr, Robert and John, were in business together and their cousin William had also joined his father in the muslin industry. The Northern Whig reported that just a year before the warehouse opened, there had been nothing on the street at all, but predicted that with four textile warehouses, it would be our future Bond Street. You can also see the Ulster Hall there on the photograph on the right, which opened in 1862, 10 years after the Workman's Warehouse opened. Thomas Workman was Robert of Ciara's third oldest son and the seventh child of 15. We know that Robert attended Belfast Academy um, when he was 10 years old and that later he moved to INST or the Royal Belfast Academical Institution. But rather than go on to Queen's College after that, in the 1860s, Thomas Workman entered the business with his brother, George Augustus. By this time, the family had branched out into linen as well as muslin. This appears to have taken place during the cotton famine of 1862-3, when T and G A Workman was established to meet a big expansion of the linen business. Tom's two passions were yachting and natural history. At weekends, he took his yacht out and during the summer holidays, went as far as Scotland and around the Scottish coast. When he moved to Craig Dara in the 1880s, Tom and his wife Meg and their family attended Bally Gilbert Presbyterian Church. In 1892, Thomas had an argument with the minister there about the new church that was going to be built. The minister wanted to spend money on stabling for horses and carriages, but Thomas wanted to spend it on an organ. Not getting his way, Thomas then set up Helens Bay Presbyterian Church, or at least was one of the founding members. Thomas was less involved in political concerns than other family members, but he did participate in mass agitation over home rule. In 1892, a local committee nominated him as a delegate to the Ulster Unionist Convention held in Belfast that year. Like many liberal Presbyterians, the Workman family were against home rule, and Tom's children actually took part in the Lauren gun running of 1914. When I visited the Craig Dara estate, I noticed this rifle lying around, and I took a photo of it. It was found buried at the back of a shed in the walled garden, part of a secret cache hidden during the gun running that got left behind. I think this image of a rusted 100-year-old rifle dumped shortly before the outbreak of the First World War 
is symbolic of the next generation of the Workland family, Tom and Meg's children, who went off to fight in the war. But let's go back to the previous generation, to Tom's cousin, Robert of Newton Breda. Robert was the son of Robert of York Street, who had emigrated to Belfast, remember, in the early 1800s. Robert was born in York Street and, along with his brother and two sisters, had a pleasant childhood. They took annual summer holidays along the county down coast. And some snippets from his child, childhood include swimming the channel opposite Queen's Island at the age of 12 and riding horses with his brother William around the countryside. The families of his father and Uncle John were very close and the cousins spent much time at each other's houses. Indeed, the family circle comprised a large group straddling the Irish Sea. Robert was educated both at home and school, um, a variety of schools. Despite being the eldest son, he chose not to go into the family textile business as he didn't enjoy business life. In the mid 1850s, he entered Queen's College, which had just opened in 1849, where he studied classics, mathematics and natural philosophy. When studying at Queen's College in the late 1850s, winters were a challenge as Robert recalled, the classrooms and library were freezing. Having decided to enter the Presbyterian ministry, he took classes in moral philosophy and Hebrew in the New Assemblies College, which had opened for Presbyterian divinity students. Extra tuition was provided by a Jewish rabbi in the town. And finally, Robert completed his divinity studies in New College, Edinburgh. In 1861, Robert started to work on the Belfast Town Mission. A lot was expected of young ministers and missionaries, and Robert struggled with exhaustion, spending four hours daily visiting door to door and trying to single-handedly hold open air meetings. Apparently fleas bothered him night and day. In the spring of 1859, Robert, aged 24, threw himself into the evangelical revival, traveling and preaching all over Ulster. The revival first started in the parish of Connor, outside Ballymena, County Antrim, and Robert travelled there to find out what was happening. He saw large open air meetings being addressed by humble farmers and ploughmen. For the next year, Robert travelled around Ulster and even as far as Scotland, preaching the gospel. He was not yet ordained, but many of the leaders of the Ulster revival were lay churchmen many of them young men, and in fact, many of them from the working classes. These words of Roberts give a flavour of the scenes that he experienced. He's writing about preaching in Killyleigh. He writes, Overall, indescribable consternation and confusion prevailed. By and by, an attempt was made to sing a psalm in the hope of drowning the cries and composing the people. In a few minutes, the graveyard was covered with knots of people gathered round their friends. Robert saw many conversions that year, and his son, sorry, his cousin, Thomas Workman, found personal salvation after attending a prayer meeting in 1859. Robert began a position as assistant minister at Newton Breda Presbyterian Church in 1862. The Reverend Andrew Crawford was the first minister of Newton Breda. He had begun preaching in a house and in the 1840s the church met in a cottage with a platform or pulpit made of sods. The church was built under the superintendence of Reverend James Morgan of the Short Place Church. For Robert, being an assistant minister solved the problem of the Regium Donum. As I've said, Robert had been brought up in a family of free churchmen, meaning that they disapproved of state support for churches and the Regium Donum was the state grant for Presbyterian ministers. Robert was determined to refuse the Regium Donum, but was afraid that if he refused, the church would not ordain him. Therefore, a living with a senior minister who would receive the grant solved the problem. Robert's salary was £50 per annum, and once the Reverend Crawford left, he also got the manse to live in. The manse was pulled down in 1966. 
Here we have Robert and a plaque of his wife, Sarah Davis, who married Robert in 1860. Robert and Sarah met first at church and afterwards at dancing classes. They were engaged for three years, the time needed to complete Robert's studies. In his memoir, Robert gave an idyllic picture of his courting of Sarah. Long walks together, picnics and excursions in the summer and in the winter socialising with friends. Correspondence from this period, however, between the couple reveals that they spent most of their time apart, with Sarah often putting on a brave face as she waited patiently for her fiancé to qualify and find work as a minister. When they were apart, Sarah and Robert read the same Bible chapter daily and often commented on it in their letters. They both had a very strong faith. After marriage, letters between the pair became less spiritual and focused on more mundane matters, such as children and health. In the early days, Robert found it difficult to obtain helpers in Newton Breda Church. Sometimes he and Sarah were the only Sunday school teachers. Sarah threw herself into parish work. Soon after her arrival at the manse, she started a mother's meeting in which women met and sewed clothes with material provided by Sarah. The Newton Breda manse had some land attached to it, including a vegetable garden and an orchard. The family kept servants, but Sarah did some light cooking and baking, such as making raspberry and clover vinegar and an apple pie for guests. On occasion, she performed one-off household tasks, such as varnishing the chimney in her husband's study. During Robert's frequent absences, Sarah managed the small tract of land where crops such as potatoes were grown and at least one cow was kept. And like most middle-class women, Sarah spent a lot of time sewing clothes for her family. It seems life was tough enough for Robert because in 1866, four years after he had started at Newton Breda, Robert's health broke down. This was either the first or second time he had a breakdown in his health and it would become a recurrent problem. Throughout his life, Robert suffered from persistent and debilitating chest colds. He almost certainly had asthma. In 1866, he took an extended leave of absence from the church and travelled to France for recuperation. Robert was almost certainly in the minority of Presbyterian ministers as he enjoyed an additional and substantial private income from family shares. This private income funded extensive travel and health treatments throughout his life. Robert was fortunate to be in the financial position to do this. Those from less privileged backgrounds had no financial cushion. Despite a lifetime of delicate health, Robert lived until he was in his 80s. When Robert was in France recuperating in the late 1860s, the elders of Newton Breda suggested that he resign for health reasons. Robert rather indignantly reminded them that he had just spent £300 on enlarging the manse and would wait until the church had paid him back. Although many worried about Robert's health, he stayed on. And from this time, he began what he called extemporary preaching meaning unprepared sermons, which he claimed were less trying for him and more acceptable to his congregation. Letters between Robert and Sarah reveal that Robert spent a huge amount of time travelling. As a child in the 1830s and 40s, Robert had spent the summer months in Bangor, Hollywood or on the Ayrshire coast in Scotland visiting relatives. As the century progressed, he increasingly went on holiday abroad he often visited relatives in Scotland, went on walking expeditions in the UK and Europe, and had extended stays at hydropathic clinics in Ireland and Scotland to treat his chest condition. Repeated trips to hydropathic clinics where he received vapour baths and chest compresses alleviated his symptoms, but did not cure the condition. Have a look at this itinerary of Robert's travels between 1857 and 1866. What this travel itinerary shows is a privileged lifestyle with the means and leisure to travel for recreational, family and health reasons. <laughs>
This level of travel, a lot in less than 10 years, was unusual for a Presbyterian minister or any middle-class clergyman, but Robert used a private income to fund it. He was fortunate in being able to procure time off work. This was managed sometimes by the granting of official periods of leave for health reasons, but more often by informally arranging substitutes managed by his wife, Sarah, in his absence. Many of Robert's letters home read like travel journals, with only one or two lines commenting on domestic matters. For example, a letter sent from Scotland in September 1863 is full of his own news, with a single line at the end, I hope you are getting on well at home, and that both babies are in a strong state. Sarah's letters frequently expressed the fact that she missed Robert. One letter revealed the heartache that his absences could cause. Upon receiving a long looked for letter from her husband, after a period of time without hearing from him, Sarah cried a great deal, for as she told him, I was beginning to think you had forgotten me. Writing from Scotland in May 1864, Robert remembered the very anxious look on Sarah's face as they had parted from one another. Illnesses of children were great times of anxiety. On another occasion, when Robert was in Bavaria in Germany in 1867, the children took measles. Sarah struggled to tend them while suffering herself from repeated migraines. When Sarah was pregnant or ill, Robert expressed some concern in letters, once telling her from Germany that a qualm of uneasiness came over him when he thought about her now and again. Robert's travels are in black and Sarah's in red. You can see that Sarah spent far less time travelling or on holiday. She spent June 1864 in Groomsport, but only, it appears, to seek a cure for persistent headaches. Sarah had a large family. She and Robert had nine children. Seven of them survived to adulthood. In July 1882, Sarah Workman died shortly after giving birth to her ninth child, Theodora. A few years later, Robert married the children's German governess, Anna Dittler, who was in her early 20s. During Robert's many absences from home, he sent instructions to Sarah relating to the organising of Sunday services. So Sarah took on a big part of his workload, ensuring that the correct church announcements were made, that the church calendar was followed, and ultimately that the pulpit was filled in Robert's absence. She visited congregational absentees to try to coax them back to church. Robert was particularly anxious that she pay frequent visitors, visits to the Kennedys, wealthy local landowners at nearby Rosetta House, whom the workmans courted to ensure they remained in the congregation. Usually Robert arranged preaching substitutes, but not infrequently Sarah found herself responsible for finding speakers. She made decisions independently. For example, when one preacher spoke for an hour and a quarter, she barred him from returning and hunted for an alternative. Her work facilitated both the running of the church and Robert's vacations. It was unpaid labour. After one particularly busy round of visitation, Sarah joked to Robert that she deserved a stipend. But she was not always jovial and she felt anxious when the pulpit was unfilled for upcoming services. Probably the greatest difficulty Robert had to face during his ministry was the opposition to organ music in the Presbyterian Church. Most Presbyterian churches sang only unaccompanied psalms. Robert had always enjoyed singing hymns as well as psalms. As a boy, he had attended an independent chapel in Donegal Street, which sang hymns, and he was convinced that the accompaniment of an organ improved the singing of a congregation. As a child in York Street, his mother had played the chamber organ at home. It's not known how he persuaded his elders to make the experiment, but Robert installed an organ at Newton Breda, and for many years, in the morning service, only unaccompanied psalms were sung, and in the evening service, hymns and psalms were accompanied by the organ. In 
Newton Breda featured prominently in the instrumental music controversy which agitated the Presbyterian Church from 1868 until 1884. A strong lobby in the General Assembly was against the use of organs and they put a lot of pressure on Robert and others to discontinue the use of organs. Robert resisted and mounted a strong defence of the organ. In 1879, Robert wrote to his cousin Thomas, I have been greatly beset with temporizers who advise me to discontinue the harmonium for the present, but I cannot see the wisdom of their counsel. The battle is nearly fought out and it would be folly to stop and have to begin again. I have now 78 pounds towards the organ. Sarah joins me in love to you and Maggie, your affectionate cousin, Robert Workman. Robert also wrote letters to the press on the subject and in 1881 he delivered a speech to the General Assembly entitled The Newton Breda Organ Defended. Here Robert was continuing in the Workman family tradition of taking a liberal view on a controversial issue and in supporting freedom of conscience. Like his cousin Tom, who he wrote to, who had founded a church partly so it could have an organ, like his great uncle John, who repeatedly wrote to the press about the moral responsibility of looking after the poor, or his uncle Robert, who left May Street Church because Cook refused to separate church and state. Robert stood up for what he believed in the face of criticism. If remembered at all today, the Workman family are mostly remembered because of Frank Workman, Tom's youngest brother, who founded Workman Clark Shipyard. I haven't mentioned him today as I wanted to focus on other members of the family. Through this talk, I hope I have helped to show the place and the influence of this Presbyterian family in Victorian Belfast and how their Presbyterianism, particularly its evangelical aspect, shaped their own lives. They took their faith seriously and its role in their lives was evident. It's important to say that this was not unusual. In fact, it was typical of most people in Victorian Belfast, particularly their class of society. Thank you. <laughs>